warfare for humanity, even as it ascended into the stars. In the universe of Battletech, never wandered far from the beaten path it laid down in Terra's ancient past. Infantry, for instance, are still very much essential in human warfare, even into the eras of the Star League and beyond. Armored fighting vehicles, in the form of tanks and other support systems, still stalk the field of war looking for prey, though now share it with the newest arrivals, the mighty battle mechs. But there are other things which simply haven't truly gone away. Lasers and particle cannons, new arrivals on the scene as far as weaponry are concerned, became mere instruments in the assembly of deadly tools for humans to use against one another. However, these have never supplanted their counterparts. Ammunition-fed rifles persist, and in their current form can track their most basic histories back to the 18th century. Cannons and their descendants, the autocannons, no matter how sophisticated, have themselves long-reaching histories that trail all the way back to the 12th century. Lasers and cannons of various sorts are mainstay vehicle weapons in all eras of Battletech, but there is one major category of offensive power I've not mentioned yet, and one which is perhaps the most devastating. It is a series of weapons that can trace their origins back to the 13th century in ancient China, before they spread across the world. The rocket, which would evolve into the modern missile, is a type of weapon with incredible attributes and power. Able to be fired using their own internal fuel supply, they can take on many forms, and were renowned throughout history for being able to spread terror throughout the ranks of the victims they were targeted towards. These deadly, powerful creations, like most human weapons, became more and more advanced with time, benefiting from industrialization like the other means of waging war. This resulted in their evolution into the vicious and destructive, overwhelming attackers of the 20th century. These war-bringing materials, and the means of delivering and transporting them, are a true staple of human conflict, and have taken on several different, but consistent forms. Typically, the entire delivery system, the full form of these devils, is that of a vehicle, either in the outline of a truck, armored or otherwise, or some kind of tracked chassis that is then mounted with a series of missile tubes, missile racks, or missile launchers. This combined and complete system allows them to traverse the battlefield and provide support in a very real way, unleashing everything from waves of deadly bombardments to guided precision strikes, depending on how its offensive package is delivered. Even once mankind left the Earth, much like with cannons, this cruel technology moved with mankind, and the concept would evolve into the subject of this overview. Because, once an idea, a meme if you will, has latched on to society and proved itself useful, it will never truly disappear. And missile platforms seem to be no different. So, Without any more preamble, let us begin to look at the state of this classic concept inside of Battletech and Mech Warrior Missile Carriers. Unverified, but implied to have existed since the Song Dynasty in ancient China. Rockets and later missiles have had an enormous impact on warfare throughout human history. The great leap in terms of their use truly came during the major conflicts of the 20th century. Once married to a mechanized platform, and therefore being able to keep up with most motorized and armored formations in campaigns, they became a truly terrifying specter on the battlefield. Whether it be the Katusha batteries made famous in gigantic clashes on the Eastern Front in the 1940s and their successor systems, or the advanced and accurate multiple rocket launch systems that have appeared since the 1970s, the haunting form of missile assaults have become a great terror on most battlefields. In the world of Battletech, this truly never vanished, 
but indeed evolved into several forms. Although comically given an introductory date of 2470 in-universe, missile carriers in all of their forms really functionally descend from the times I just mentioned. In technical readouts published over the last two decades, there has been an attempt to imply that Quicksell originally created these almost generic missile platforms, and that all vehicles that are associated with them are more or less copies of the original SRM and LRM carrier designs, even going as far as to imply that after the Fourth Succession War, they sued multiple manufacturers who copied their platforms. While this appears to be canonical and true, it's not reflective of the original and much more reasonable description of LRM and SRM carriers as described in Technical Readout 3026 and 3026 Revised. In this original description, the concept behind these devastating war machines is much more fluid. The chassis may change, and the nature of their payloads may be adjusted, but functionally these vehicles have existed long before any recognized armored fighting vehicle has been in the setting, whether that be in the form of battle mechs or other famous AFVs. Quicksell hardly created the idea of stacking missiles on top of an armored transport and using it for close or long-range support. The thing that fascinates me most about these carriers is the original interpretation of them, which isn't necessarily the status quo. They weren't set vehicles in-universe, because that wouldn't make any sense making them much more analogous to some of the weaponry already found in Battletech. Which for game rules are the same tonnage, but change wildly per individual system, at least in theory, SRM and LRM carriers are not a set physical design. They don't all use the same frame. They don't even necessarily have the same payloads. But again, are streamlined to fit into the game. What does that mean? A down-armored, Engine-swapped Scorpion light tank chassis may be the basis for an SRM-60 missile carrier, just as one example. A custom, on-planet body may be the core of an LRM carrier alternative as well. Such vehicles are general approximations of what these are, rather than definitively confirmed structures. It's just so remarkably different than the set designations of the tanks and battle mechs of the setting by contrast. For instance, we know what a Marauder 3R is in every respect. We know the specific particle cannons it uses. We know what armor type it has. And these things are all very set. More than any other types of vehicles in the game, the missile carriers are really just vague and are whatever they need to be. They are built by almost anyone with an industrial base at all. The missile racks they have may be what they are in game, but in universe, the brand, type, and even the quantity of rockets and missiles are really just whatever can be put together by the planet. Forgive me for delving into this for so long, but just the unset nature of them I find to be truly endearing, and one of the most realistic elements of the setting. It doesn't make sense that everyone just repeatedly copies Quicksell. Not because industrial espionage and intellectual property theft aren't rampant in Battletech, but because dropping a ton of missile tubes on top of an armored chassis isn't hard. It's actually really, really easy even. It's pretty clear why these vehicles were given such generic names when originally introduced. But there have been newer innovations regarding these venerable, tried and tested designs in universe that are much more set in stone in regards to their chassis, payloads, and appearances. A few examples would be things like the heavy LRM carrier from the Magistry of Canopus and the MRM carrier from the Draconis Combine, but there are others as well. Regardless, on the battlefield itself, almost every form of missile carrier is exceptionally dangerous, and they are incredibly cheap to manufacture. Not only can these inexpensive vehicles be churned out by local industries, easily being added to local militia or garrison forces to protect planets, their payloads can often down even the strongest of adversaries. Legendary battle mechs like the Centurion, or even technologically sophisticated and terrifying machines like the Timberwolf, can and do fall prey to these seemingly insignificant combat participants. And the reason for that is very obvious to any veteran of the battlefield. 
both in universe and on the tabletop. An arrogant inner sphere or clan commander who moves too close to a tree line with several concealed SRM carriers will be torn to pieces in a single volley of fire. Two SRM carriers will launch 120 SRMs into a Timberwolf, for example, and even if they fail to penetrate its armor, though this is doubtful given the volume, the number of through armor criticals and head strikes will cripple the mech in the first attack, just to give some perspective. And these are a fraction of the cost of the infamous and sinister war machine they just brought low. To give another example, when engaging enemy mechs or vehicles, an LRM carrier hidden behind a hill or wall with coordinated indirect fire will be a persistent, crippling threat in a combat zone, slathering targets in wave upon wave of missiles while staying out of trouble. Even formidable, heavily guarded mechs like the Atlas will discover that their plating slowly but surely will weather away like rocks resisting a powerful river. Functionally speaking, these systems are likely some of the most effective for cost military assets can be constructed for planetary defense. Logistics may complicate their use small in the attack, especially if they are localized models needing repair parts. But when defending a world, even the strongest of forces can be blunted by their clever and lethally planned usage. Each one of these nefarious objects is but an organ of doom, playing a song of seemingly the end of the world with each missile that leaves its tubes. In other words, with each note played. First displayed in XTRO Primitives Volume 2, the first carriers, in the form of the AC, LRM, and SRM carriers of the Age of War, are by far the most basic versions of these vehicles currently with rules in the game. Using the same principle as modern missile systems, both in-game but also in how they are generic, these vehicles are still nonetheless remarkably dangerous, even into the more recent eras of Battletech. The core chassis and controls of these units weigh 8.5 tons, with the units themselves being 55 tons in total. They have one ton of fuel and an internal combustion engine. Their maximum speed is 54 kilometers per hour, and they have bar six armor type, making them more susceptible to critical hits, even if the armor isn't penetrated by incoming fire. Their payloads are very simple. Primitive LRM carriers have three LRM-15s with 40 rounds of fire, and an advanced fire control system for the time. Primitive SRM carriers have nine SRM-4s, 200 rounds of fire for all of them collectively, and once more, an advanced fire control system. This amount of attacking power is dangerous in any part of the setting. Such barrages can strip heavy mechs and annihilate mediums, but they are unfortunately burdened beyond their bar six armor, as they possess the obsolete 2580 rule. This makes them extremely difficult to repair after their time in the setting has sunset. Regardless, they are still very impressive, despite the limitations placed upon them due to their primitive status. The quick cell specific configuration of the SRM carrier, first introduced in 2470, is the general representation of the concept of the short-range missile vehicle in the Battletech tabletop game, and is renowned for its lethality. Mech warriors of all walks of life, with any degree of sanity, fear it for what it can do if left unaddressed in any battle. An SRM carrier ambush might be one of the most remarkable and dangerous encounters any veteran of combat has faced. The frames of these machines are brutally simple, and would be left almost unchanged for seemingly 600 years. There is a reason why this tried and tested warrior has the reputation it does. The core chassis of this 60-ton death dealer is frankly very, very simple, being only a few years ahead of its primitive precursors. It has a base 6-ton internal structure and 3 tons of control equipment. No life support equipment is on board, 
nor does it have any heat sinks to speak of. Despite having the appearance of a turret, it is not a traversable one, so it can only fire in its forward arc more or less. This is unsurprisingly a potentially limiting factor for the vehicle as well. In regards to its engine, it is powered by a 14-ton, 180 intercombust internal combustion engine, allowing it to flank at a sluggish maximum speed of just 54 kilometers per hour, or five movement points in the tabletop game, which is inadequate, but we'll get into why later. For defensive plating, it is rocking a massive three tons of standard armor. Entirely unrelated to this immense level of protection and just as a side tangent, you better not get shot at, my friends. That would be bad. Now we get into the weaponry side of things, which is really the only reason anyone takes this true monster. The SRM carrier in this form comes armed with a shocking 10 SRM-6 launchers, giving it 60 missile tubes to fire every turn. This is, unsurprisingly, a fight-ending amount of firepower. It does only possess 60 individual rounds of fire for the launcher, but let's be honest, it's not going to matter if they get into range. With us looking over all of its features, what is there to say? Let's start with its strengths. As just mentioned, it has the firepower to level an assault mech with an optimal opportunity. Critical hits through exposed plating or through TACs will be abundant, and this says nothing of knocking out or killing the pilots as well. It will sandblast targets first into the scrap heap and then into the afterlife. Where its weaknesses begin are, sadly, everywhere else. To start with, its armored plating exists more to protect the crew from the effects of firing their missiles than from incoming fire. Meaning that yes, if it is hit by any meaningful enemy fire, the vehicle will be damaged severely or destroyed. The problem is then further enhanced by the fact that the machine moves at the same pace as a 100 ton assault mech, making it an immediate fire beacon. This lack of tactical mobility means it can struggle to generate defensive bonuses, or escape a bad situation, or even may fail to exploit a weakened enemy. The ideal engagement for the SRM carrier is to lay an ambush, hidden within a city or behind rolling hills or forests waiting quietly for its prey to approach it, before reaching out and striking, hitting unaware targets, or ones which cannot avoid having to engage the vehicle on its terms. Despite the high-risk nature of the vehicle, it is one of the most frightening sights to see in any engagement, no matter the era. Mirroring the engine, chassis, armor, and overall features of the SRM carrier, the only key difference between the LRM carrier and its cousin, at least in their base forms, is the weapon systems on board. Though importantly, this radically changes the role of this AFV on the battlefield, as you might imagine. Whereas SRMs are close-range killers, LRMs, meaning long-range missiles, are quite obviously focused on reaching out and making differences at further distances. An absurd number of LRMs are on board this monster, mirroring its SRM cousin. It comes armed with three front-facing LRM-20 launchers, with a total of 24 rounds of split fire between the three. Striking at over twice the range of SRM missiles, and being able to indirect fire, the battlefield longevity and survivability of the LRM carrier is greatly enhanced. It is very much possible for these to sit out of sight of their enemies and lob missiles towards spotted targets in volley after volley of fire. This alone just means it is less likely to be destroyed, and its enemies have to work harder and more deliberately to remove it from play. Should its own forces be unable to prevent it from being directly engaged, the LRM carrier is surely doomed for the same reasons the SRM carrier is. Low armor and low mobility. All the same, it may be easier said than done to stop this missile-slinging monster without the exertion of significant forces. It is a fantastic support vehicle, as a result.
First built in 3063, and by the Draconis Combine, I might add, the MRM carrier is a derivative of the traditional LRM carrier. It has the same engine, movement profile, tonnage, and armored plating as its cousin, and is built on a similar, if not exactly the same chassis. The primary difference between the LRM carrier and the MRM carrier is really the fact that medium-range missiles don't shoot as far, are less accurate, but shoot larger volumes of missiles. It has three MRM-30s, replacing its three LRM-20s, and has 24 rounds for them once more. It has an effective range of 15 hexes, and it can't indirect fire, which oddly makes it closer to an SRM carrier in its battlefield deployment. It also, like many Combine units from this time, comes installed with a C3 system, in this case a slave, to let it be networked with other friendly forces, which definitely increases its lethality. Sure, its MRMs are less accurate, but they have the potential to do much more damage. The only problem? It has to expose itself to fight. And once it does, its time as an active battlefield participant will be trickling down. Because any enemy commander or mech warrior would be a fool not to pour fire into this monster. It fires just shy of 100 missiles with every volley. No one wants to deal with that. Really, not wanting to be hit by the full assault of this thing. It's just like every other carrier, come to think of it. For 600 years, as far as the official designs are concerned, no one looked at the broad concept of the SRM carrier and asked, can we just do that, but for less weight? But in the 31st century, in 3058 specifically, the Torian Concordat canonically did just that, when they created the Light SRM Carrier. Innovation just takes a bit of time, everyone. A set design, rather than the more generic nature of the other core launcher versions, this vehicle is a basic wheeled 40-ton chassis, rather than a tracked 60-ton one. Powered by a 10-ton, 140 internal combustion engine, it can reach a maximum respectable speed of 64 kilometers per hour, and it has the massive benefit of having a turret on board for its weaponry as well, giving it a much greater arc of fire. After this, its armor goes up to 4.5 tons, letting it soak more damage potentially before being knocked out. Note, this is still not an abundance of armor. All of this is only made possible because it only has 5 SRM-6s, or 30 SRM tubes as it were, instead of 60. And it has 45 rounds of fire for these deadly systems as well. Overall, it's a practical, smart upgrade over the original. Faster, more armored, lighter, and even more economical to produce. There are huge virtues for this periphery-born traditional military vehicle. Anyone who thinks it's easy to tank being blasted by 5 SRM-6s is out of their mind. While the Taurians aimed at decreasing the size of the traditional SRM carriers to gain advantage, the Magistracy of Canopus opted to do the opposite in regards to the LRM carrier, and instead scaled it into the heavy LRM carrier. First conceived and built in 3058 by Magistracy Metals, this machine was conceived with a very simple idea in mind. What if we made the LRM carrier bigger? Inspired by the Torian's light SRM carrier, the Canopians did the opposite with the original canonical design, and simply made it bigger. Significantly bigger. Going from a heavy vehicle to an assault vehicle didn't present many issues, especially when scaling from 60 to 80 tons. Its frame simply gets heavier. Its armor scales to 4 tons, which is still pitiful. Meaning this is not a frontline fighting machine, just like its inspiration. In order to keep the vehicle cheap and easy to assemble in the periphery and likely to save on costs, its engine is shifted to an Internacombust 160 power plant. This gives it a dismal maximum speed of 32 kilometers per hour, 
making it extremely vulnerable if it is not guarded carefully. But outside of the sacrifices it clearly makes to enhance its size, what are the benefits you may ask? Well, let me tell you right now. It has four LRM-20s on board, giving it 80 missile tubes to attack with every turn. It also benefits from having 12 rounds of fire per launcher too, because it's a vehicle and isn't impacted by missiles for generating heat either, it can fire every single turn. This juggernaut is rightly regarded for its fearsome firepower, but you must remember, it has four tons of armor and will struggle to reposition itself, let alone escape fast strikers that will be hunting it. Its power is firmly held in check by its shortcomings. It, along with the light SRM carrier, are major exports that ship across the periphery and beyond. What if there was a vehicle that was prolific and yet had no real official rules? What if such a vehicle lurks in the pages of sourcebooks and novels, but is entirely devoid of battle value, cost, or record sheet? While some will invent various configurations, the reality is, as of the time of writing this script and making this video, as far as I can tell, despite being referenced multiple times for decades, there is no playable rules in classic Battletech for the fabled Arrow 4 carrier. What does it do? It's probably very similar to an SRM or LRM carrier. It appears to be based on the SRM carrier's chassis, given its profile on the master unit list. And it probably has one or two Arrow 4 launchers, with ammunition of various types. There it is everyone, one of the biggest holes in the roster. First formed when it was mentioned in Field Manual Draconis Combine, all the way back in the 90s. It does have rules for Alpha Strike at least though, so you can play it in that. Technically not built on the original chassis of the traditional missile carriers by Quicksell, the Arrow 4 Assault Vehicle is in essence a successor to the design and fills the role of a dedicated missile artillery platform in the way that the Arrow 4 carrier should. In fact, many commanders will assume that the A4AV is in fact just an Arrow 4 carrier, when it is not. Envisioned by the Canopians as being a successor to the very adept and powerful Arrow 4 demolisher tank variant, this would be another homegrown, mostly periphery product. First produced in 3089, just after the Blakus had been defeated within the Inner Sphere, this co-production between the now independent Endurian and the Magistracy of Canopus would see wild success, being deployed across large portions of the Inner Sphere and periphery. First, the carrier comes in at 80 tons. Next, it comes with a standard 240 fusion engine, giving it a maximum speed of 54 kilometers per hour, lining up with other long-range support vehicles of this type. This engine is more expensive, but it is not fuel-dependent, improving its value as a tank greatly. This also gives it the benefit of heat sinks, and it does indeed have 14 of them overall. After this, the A4AV has an impressive 13.5 tons of heavy ferrofibrous armor, giving it a shocking 267 points of protection making this vehicle an impressively tough nut to crack. As if that weren't enough, it comes with twin anti-missile systems on board, along with 24 rounds of ammunition for them, enhancing its already excellent protection. Yet furthermore, to get into its offensive systems, the assault vehicle comes stocked with two medium variable speed pulse lasers for close defense, and of course, a devastating Arrow 4 missile system. And it has an impressive 20 rounds of ammunition, it also benefits from the fast reload quirk. Very nice. In short, it has an excellent level of defense, acceptable mobility for its role, a more modernized engine and cooling system, weapons to defend itself in close, and a big missile launcher, along with excellent campaign and battlefield stamina. It's a shame that it's not a true member of the original missile carrier family, but it looks like this adopted machine 
does more than fit in. What more is there really to say? The carrier model of vehicles has never really gone out of style, even in the 31st and 32nd centuries of combat, where many states, militaries, and mercenary units looked towards giant, striding battle mechs to make war upon their enemies. The more practical and honestly economically minded may realize for defending their own worlds one can really just look towards the tried and tested models of the past. From the wars of the early 20th century forward, carrier platforms have always found value, and for a clear reason. They are easy to build, anyone can really do it with a meaningful industrial base, and they are extremely effective. Just remember, Quicksell may be the primary designers of these machines in their early histories. But these instruments are everywhere, and are made functionally by everyone. Their proliferation is a testimony to their success. Cities have burned, and armies have routed, even armies led by battle mechs, because of songs played by these varied and deadly instruments. Look on the bright side, kid. You get to keep all the money. Thank you all for joining me here today. This is my first video I've actually recorded and put out since the Warhammer 2C was finally completed. I hope everyone enjoys. I actually originally planned to get this out beforehand, but that just didn't work out. Remember, if you like this video, hit the like button, it does help. If you would like to get more content like this or other content that I make that's almost all Battletech related, don't forget to subscribe. And of course, next week I am going to aim to get the Atlas 2 video out as well, so keep your eye open for that. I almost forgot to do this again. Remember in the top pinned comment for the video, I will have the resources I used to make this video. On top of that though, I'm going to have links to the various vehicles I referenced in this video in terms of their miniatures on Ironwind Metals, as well as a list of the plastic packs that they are a part of for when the Mercenaries Kickstarter ships and these things start appearing at retail. Just giving you a heads up. A huge thank you, as always, to all of the channel members. You guys are what allows this to actually happen, so thank you very much, guys. So as the final part of this outro, why don't you guys tell me, what do you think of missile carriers? Do you think they're good? Do you think they're bad? Do you think they work on tabletop? Or do you think that they require a bit too much finesse? Either way, I will hopefully catch all of your comments in the section below.